Thank you very much, Jeremy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Scott Steedman, and what an honour and a privilege it is to be here uh, to address you this evening uh, uh, for this uh, Mountbatten Lecture. Uh, what I want to do over the next hour is to uh, rebase our understanding of this little useful but rather little understood tool for industry, and hopefully to excite you about the potential that standards bring to underpin the next phase of industrial growth, supporting innovation, productivity, and trade. I want to focus on the role of standards in the digital economy, which is sweeping towards us, and how we might exploit, even reinvent this medium as a powerful enabler for economic advantage in the global economy. In 1901, Sir John Wolfe Barry, president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, the ICE, from 1896 to 98, and Sir Douglas Fox, president from 1899 to 1900, held the first committee meeting of the Committee on Standard Sections, which became the Engineering Standards Committee later that same year. But one of the key figures at that time that I'd like to highlight was the Electrical Assistant Secretary of the Engineering Standards Committee, Charles Le Maistre, a British electrical engineer and a member of the Institution of Electrical Engineers, IEEE parent uh, of the IET. In June 1902, probably encouraged by Le Maistre, the IEEE was invited to nominate members to the ESC. A new committee on electrical plant was quickly formed with three subcommittees on generators, motors and transformers, on cables and on telegraphs and telephones. By 1905, four electrical reports had been published and seven more subcommittees added to the original three. There was also considerable interest in international collaboration and in 1906, the UK hosted the meeting that led to the foundation of the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC, at the Cecil Hotel in London, barely 100 metres from here. Le Maistre was appointed the first General Secretary of the IEC, a post that he held until his death in 1953, whilst also doing my job of running the National Standards Body from 1916 to 1942. He was a legend in the IEC, and he became known in international standardization circles as the deus ex machina, the godlike figure who appears in Greek tragedies to rescue everyone. In 1918, presumably under Le Maistre's spell, the professional institutions established the ESC as an independent body called the British Engineering Standards Association, and following the granting of a royal charter in 1929, the association was renamed the British Standards Institution, or as we call it today, BSI, in 1931. The links between the UK and international standardization continued with the formation of ISO. After initial meetings in New York and Paris in 1945 and 46, it was, yes, Le Maistre, who yet another capacity, at this time as General Secretary of the short-lived United Nations Standards Coordinating Committee, arranged for BSI to hold the 12-day conference at the ICE from the 14th of October 1946, where the resolution was passed to establish the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO. In his opening address to the 1946 conference, Lord Woolton, then president of BSI, explained British industry's attitude to standards in words that you may find familiar. He said, in Great Britain, we have been actively involved on this work for some time, but during the course of the war, it has been brought very clearly indeed to our notice how very much better off we should have been during that period when it was necessary to have enormous productivity if we had taken a little more notice of the advice that the British Standards Institution had given to our engineering firms. The Engineering Standards Committee had it in mind from the outset the importance of standards uh, for commerce, and its very first project was to agree on a set of dimensional requirements for steel sections, and its very first report, known as BS1, was published in February 1903. This is what it looked like. It's what we would call today a standard for interoperability. Engineers used the new standard as a shorthand form of communication with a supplier. The supplier knew what was required and how it would be measured. Standards based on stakeholder consensus that set out specifications for general use bring their greatest advantage when they're universal. A client can invite several suppliers to compete on the same basis, 
and yet be confident that whichever supplier was selected, the component will fit. Suppliers are incentivized to compete on quality and price. Innovation becomes less risky as standards provide one of the essential business tools to support new product development and market access. Visiting the Dyson Research Center in Gloucestershire a few weeks ago, I talked with their standards team about the role of standards and in innovation. The Dyson view is that, and I quote, well-drafted and widely adopted standards can move technology forward and remove barriers to global trade. Effective standards can encourage invention and investment in the development of new technologies. This is a fundamental theme of this lecture this evening. The UK engineering profession was not alone in recognizing the power of standards. From the late 19th and throughout the 20th century, other industrialized countries came to the same realization that in the fields of engineering and technology in particular, it was important to harness good practices and to share these widely as a basis for economic development. Germany was a particularly important player with its two great standardization organizations, <laughs> DEAN, founded in 1917, and VDE, founded in 1893 in the electrotechnical domain. But so too were the widely respected US professional engineering bodies, such as the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, now the IEEE, founded in 1884, and the ASTM, the American Society for Testing and Materials, founded in 1898, which were both engaged in standardization activities from the outset. Despite this, it's a fact that the role of standards in economic development is not well studied and it is certainly not well taught in the UK. Today, to our knowledge, there is not one module on the role of standards for enterprise in any MBA program in the UK, nor in any university engineering course. There's plenty of advice on intellectual property, patents and copyright protection, but nothing on the role of standards in industry or how standards form the backbone of global, regional and national market frameworks within which engineering companies and professionals need to compete and prosper. We need to correct this. Amongst many in the engineering profession, especially in high usage sectors, the role of standards has come to be thought of largely as a compliance tool rather than a body of knowledge and a strategic enabler for industry. Recent market research sponsored by BSI and carried out by independent consultants Britain Thinks found that in high usage sectors where standards have become established and indispensable, they're seen as a necessary tool for compliance. Attitudes in low usage sectors, by contrast, reflect the view that there is a significant competitive advantage in adopting standards, and senior figures in these sectors see standards as a tool for best practice and quality improvement. This is the context within which we need to work in the UK. It's not how voluntary standards are perceived in Germany, of course. You only have to look at the front cover of the German National Strategy for Industry 4.0 to realize that German industry sees standards as a fundamental tool for market development. The flowchart on the right-hand side shows how the fusion of industry understanding of market relevance and the stability and security provided by the role of standards accelerates innovation. The perception amongst many in the UK engineering sector that standards are about compliance rather than an enabler of economic growth is unfortunate. Over decades, this attitude has created a lost opportunity for industry and government in the UK, but also in many other countries, particularly amongst the developing and the emerging economies. At the root of this misperception has been widespread confusion over whether standards are a voluntary tool for industry, a contractual obligation between supplier and client, or a legal requirement imposed by government. The failure by industry and government to distinguish between standards and regulations has caused unnecessary drag on economic growth potential. It continues to pose a significant risk to those national economies that fail to realize that the greatest value from standards comes as a tool for accelerating innovation and market development, rather than the more limited value derived from using standards to describe a means of conformity with a legal requirement. In fact, as we shall see in the European system, just 20% of European standards are associated with regulation and almost all of these remain voluntary anyway. Where regulations originating in the UK refer to standards, they maintain the voluntary character. 
There are only a few where standards are made a legal requirement, such as for fire sa safety of furniture and, and nightwear. Standards are essential for a company to explain to its employees, to its customers, and to its supply chain what it stands for and what it's offering, which today means corporate social responsibility, good governance, resilience, risk management, cyber security, not just quality or regulatory compliance. But the new frontier for business is no longer quality, it's trust. And in the world of digital products and services, it's also privacy and security. So for me, the productivity, competitiveness, and growth of the engineering and technology sector is a matter of delivering enterprise success. It's not simply about products, but about the subtle reputational issues that touch on a wide range of other stakeholders, also essential to the future of business. Not just suppliers, but customers, governments, and regulators in particular. Standards have no inherent value, unlike a commodity, which does. Their value lies in the transaction between two parties, customer and supplier, regulator and industry, retailer and consumer. Standards provide a means for one party to provide assurance to another that they are following good industry practice. The value of standards to both parties derives from the increase in trust and the common understanding between them. Consensus standards provide the easy way for industry, society, or governments to set out their commitment to good practice. 95% of the national standards we publish in each year in the UK are international or European. We are at the top of the international league table in terms of using international standards. National standards in the UK therefore demonstrate a commitment by UK industry to the alignment of national business practice with international practice. Last Friday, I was with the Director of Standards for China, my opposite number, Dr. Tian Shihong, Administrator of the Standardization Administration of China, SAC. We work closely together on international standards, and I invited him to comment for this lecture on the importance of international standards in China and China's commitment to the model that we follow in the UK of one standard used everywhere. Here he is, speaking in Mandarin. There are subtitles at the bottom of the screen. 感谢斯伯特先生提供这个机会下面我来谈谈国际标准在中国所发挥的作用中国是ISO、IEC非常活跃的成员 国际标准在中国的推广应用，努力提升中国标准与国际标准水平的一致性程度。我们高度重视国际标准在中国产业发展中所起的作用，努力希望能够实现一个标准全球通用。China sees the role of international standards as a high priority for its industries which want to work to one standard used everywhere. So let's see standards for what they really are. A structured approach to the definition of what good looks like. Dynamic, stakeholder-driven, consensus-based, with ongoing governance and global reach. Standards are regularly reviewed and easily updated as technical development proceeds. Standards are a passport to trade, a common platform for industry to build competitive advantage. Standards aren't competing with expert knowledge held in the professional institutions or in the academic journals and publications. Standards are certainly not competing with regulation. Instead, we should see standards as usable consensus knowledge that draws on wide input and it's governed by those affected day to day. The model of full stakeholder engagement, open public consultation and consensus can achieve a highly valuable outcome, a shared view of the current state of knowledge, not fettered in regulation or challenged in an academic journal, but usable in millions, indeed billions, of daily transactions that oil the wheels of economic activity, of trade, innovation and growth. So let me be absolutely clear, standards are a differentiator not a level playing field. The law creates the level playing field in all market economies. 
Standards enable market access and support business performance improvement. Let me turn now to the question of innovation. The rise of computerization in the late 20th century, which we're all familiar with, enabling the automation of production, is generally thought of as the third industrial revolution. We're beyond that now, and the fourth industrial revolution, the digital revolution, is in motion, including what the Germans describe as Industry 4.0. The digitization of the UK and global economy is a tsunami. Its effects appear modest at first, but as we approach a tipping point in availability and use of data, the impact of the digital revolution will be huge and rapid. We're already seeing traditional business models being disrupted and new models emerging. Digitization has the potential to flip leading economies into an entirely new model of labor and production, a connected economy. McKinsey Global Institute in their report, Digital America, published in 2015, described it as a tale of the haves and the have mores, an economic revolution where the gap is widening between those that embrace the wave of change and those that follow. There is a great risk that it becomes a winner takes all world, which I'll return to later. The role of consensus knowledge has never been more important in underpinning technological development, ensuring that we can build on the present and deliver more with less each and every time we innovate. So how does consensus knowledge support uh, innovation? Let me give a specific example to illustrate the role of standards in innovation. The UK is known for its pioneering scientific research into graphene as a new wonder material. China is very interested in the opportunities for manufacturers to commercialize graphene. Last year, Dr. Qian Shi Hong visited the National Graphene Institute in Manchester to see the UK capabilities for himself. In fact, manufacturers in China are already starting to place products incorporating graphene on the market. The challenge for industry is that to date, there is no international standard defining graphene in ways that could accelerate commercialization, meaning that when you think you're purchasing graphene, you may be purchasing graphite. UK, scienti UK scientists define graphene as a single molecular layer, but scientists elsewhere may take a different view. And this has a direct impact on industry investment and the potential for market development. Today, both researchers and industry are exposed to the absence of any consensus on the actual nature of graphene from the perspective of a manufacturer, a consumer, or a regulator. Developing internationally agreed standards for industry in this area would bring immediate benefit to everyone. To encourage this, the UK-China Standards Corporation Commission, which was formed last year, building on our 2013 agreement, has formed a dedicated working group of UK and Chinese technical experts to agree on a common approach. Moving from emerging technologies to industry practice, building information modeling, or BIM for short, is an example of standards accelerating innovation in the construction sector in the UK. Funded by government, a suite of UK developed standards on the data formats used in design, construction, and operation is now available. First use of these standards has led to considerable capital cost savings, with the full expectation of substantial through life savings. These standards that are known as the PAS 1192 series range from data formats to cybersecurity. They are standards for the digital age, recognizing that the modernization of industry for the benefit of clients and consumers requires a common approach to the digital information on which the value of the built asset, building or infrastructure is now determined. With a comprehensive data set available to owners, operators and users, from design to decommissioning, there's not only increased efficiency, but seamless interoperability, just as Wolf Barry anticipated 116 years ago. Today, with the support of other nations, BSI has offered the PAS 1192 suite of standards to the world through our membership uh, of ISO. These standards will soon become the globally accepted practice and adopted worldwide. This creates an immediate and evident competitive advantage for those early adopters who are already familiar with this approach. So engaging with good industry practices for their products and services, processes and people in a simple and open way for businesses everywhere to find out what good looks like. We've scarcely begun to exploit the true value of standards in the global economy. This is despite evidence that standards accelerate enterprise. Independent economic analysis by consultant CBR in 2015 found that for the UK, 
28.4% of annual GDP growth is attributable to the use of standards, equivalent to 8.2 billion in 2014 prices. Standards play a key role in facilitating productivity. CEBR found that 37.4% of UK productivity growth can be attributed to standards. Standards help companies to realize their global ambition by underpinning global trade. 41% of SMEs are more likely to export if they're using standards. Indeed, CEBR found that overall 6.1 billion of additional UK exports per year can be attributed to standards. But if you ask as chief executive of most of our companies in the UK, do you have a strategy for using standards to increase your productivity and performance? They say, why would I need that? I've argued that standards are a form of industry knowledge that brings added value as a differentiator through the consensus process and independent governance. Industry governments and consumers use standards as a mechanism of building trust in the transaction between them. I've discussed the role of standards in innovation. Where used smartly, standards can be an accelerator for the commercialization of new products and services, an alternative to regulation, and a tool for industry transformation. I've emphasized that the value of standards lies in the transaction between two parties, a company and its suppliers, an employee and an employer, government and industry. Standards build trust. It is, of course, possible that standards are misused, either accidentally or deliberately, to create technical barriers to trade or to prevent new entrants to the market. But so it is with all tools of the market. Intellectual property tools are notorious for their exploitation. Regulatory frameworks similarly can be used to promote or suppress market activity. In the formal standards world, there is an international structure of organizations led by ISO and IEC that oversee the cooperation of the member nations in creating a single international standards model for global economic development. At regional level, there are similar private organizations that provide a regional forum for international cooperation. In Europe, these are known as the European Standards Organizations, SENSENELEC and ETSI. So let me turn now to the question of how standards are used in international market structures and the role played by the international standards organizations and in the regional context, the European organizations. Market structures derive from a combination of regulation, intellectual property rules, and industry standards. Regulatory frameworks are created by national and local governments to establish legal requirements for the conduct of business. In many countries, governments regulate standards, either drafting technical requirements directly into law or by referencing industry standards as a legal requirement for some purpose. This is a route frequently taken by developing countries which seek to strengthen their local practices by the imposition of industry standards through regulation. Such countries may recognize the power of market pull to drive change, but often they see the regulation of standards as a necessary step on the path to adoption of international standards, somehow raising domestic standards by forcing compliance with quality schemes and marks. Speaking to representatives from the Ministry of Commerce and Industry of the Indian government and the Bureau of Indian Standards a few weeks ago, they emphasized to me the challenge of how their industry can reach the level of international standards. In India, standards are seen by government as something that must be regulated or industry will not comply. I ask them, is it working? The answer is no. My view is that international standards should be seen as a platform, a passport to trade and to do business. They're not the top of the ladder, <coughs> but the plug and play of the global economy, a common platform on which deals are done and economic resilience is built. There are more advanced standards in niche fields that are not international. There are national standards that reflect local practice. The key is to ensure that the structure of industry standards is consistent, coherent, and non-conflicting wherever possible. Regulation of industry standards, as happens in India, creates a culture of antipathy and even blame, usually of the prevailing government, rather than a culture of cooperation and aspiration. It's critical that industry consumers and governments recognize the difference between technical specifications written or referenced in regulation that become legal requirements and standards referred to as supporting instruments. In the European context, for example, the legislation that follows the model known as the new approach covers a large part of the market for goods, particularly products of lower complexity and hence 
lower potential risk. Standards are cited in European regulation under the new approach as a means of compliance. The central feature of the new approach is that the harmonization is restricted to the essential requirements. Products must be safe, presenting minimum risk to users, and must restrict hazards from mechanical, chemical, and other properties of the product. These requirements are defined in the legislation in a high-level, performance-based way. It's then left to the manufacturers to decide how they wish to demonstrate that they've met the requirements. Industry standards cited under the new approach provide a presumption of conformity for a manufacturer claiming compliance. But the ultimate test, should there be a challenge over a particular product or incident, is whether that particular product or incident breached the law, not whether it breached the standard. The new approach is not comprehensive, however, and it's important to stress that there are many other industrial sectors where more traditional approaches to the harmonization of product regulation continue. This diagram shows how, in the universe of products manufactured and placed on the markets of European countries, a number of well-known sectors remain heavily regulated due to specific legislation, including pharmaceuticals, automotive, and others. There are also areas where the harmonization model is mixed, such as the construction products regulation, the CPR, where voluntary standards were eventually made mandatory. ISO and IEC have led the way in promoting the international model for the use of voluntary consensus industry standards in international trade. The WTO, the World Trade Organization Technical Barriers to Trade Committee, refers in a decision in the year 2000 to the six principles for the development of international standards. Transparency, openness, impartiality and consensus, effectiveness and relevance, coherence, and the involvement of developing countries. Standards development in the formal landscape happens through the national delegation principle. There are no faceless bureaucrats writing standards in Geneva or Brussels. A country takes the responsibility for hosting the secretariat of a standards project or committee, and other countries will participate either directly or by shadowing the work. At the European level, there are 34 countries in the European system, including the 28 members of the EU, the EFTA countries, Turkey, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, FIROM, and recently Serbia, which joined in November 2016. The ESOs are not agencies of the EU, but they are private organizations, managing the body of European standards that are either drawn from the ISO and IEC catalog of work or they're homegrown, where there's a European interest, but no suitable ISO or IEC activity to draw on. BSI, along with other national standards bodies, maintains the infrastructure for national experts from industry, society, and government to participate in all of these forums with the specific intent that there should be no conflicting standards in the UK national marketplace. We aspire to agree one standard for any given business issue or aspect of a product, ideally written with the benefit of UK input and then adopted from the international system into the national catalogue as a British standard. In fact, UK expert activity in the international uh, standards development is very high indeed. The UK participates in 95% of all ISO committees, higher than any other country. Germany and China follow at 93%. So our priority is to work at the international level first and to achieve a consensus there so that we can use that consensus both in the European and the national context. Perhaps the single most important element in the removal of trade barriers between nations is the adoption of international standards and the withdrawal of conflicting standards to create that coherent, consistent set of industry standards in any national economy, which match an identical set of standards in other economies, the passport model. In the UK, BSI publishes around 2,500 and withdraws around 1,500 standards every year in a constant process of revision and alignment with international standards for the benefit of industry. It's a big job. Let me give you an example. For reasons of infrastructure, it's easier for Kenya to trade with Europe than with West Africa or even with South Africa. This activity has brought to Kenya a keen understanding of the role of national standards based wherever possible on international standards 
and the avoidance of conflicting standards in the domestic market. You'll all know about Kenyan products here in the UK. Charles Ongawe, Managing Director of KEBS, the Kenyan Bureau of Standards, explained to me how it works during a recent visit to Nairobi. Kenya recognizes the primacy of international standards developed by industry experts through ISO and IEC under the National Delegation Principle and the importance of adopting these as Kenyan national standards in place of local practices wherever possible. It's the same model that we use in the UK. It's the international model. The same international standard can be adopted as a Kenyan national standard, KS ISO, and a British national standard, BS ISO. Kenya follows this international model. ISO and IEC standards become Kenyan national standards, replacing any prior standards covering that field. They have a substantial program of national standards development activity, but here again, they check first if there's an international standard available. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, Charles said, or national standards in other countries that they can use. So in Europe, it's this system of adoption, wherever possible, of international standards to ensure a simplified market landscape has been extremely successful. Across the 34 countries of the European system, the number of industry standards that might have been needed for companies to trade has been reduced over 30 years from a figure of around 160,000 to about 20,000 European standards, a huge streamlining of the regional market. And as I said earlier, only about 20% of those are even mentioned in regulation. In the UK, as I mentioned earlier, around 95% of our work is on the development and adoption of international and European standards. The UK hosts around 200 international committees, including all the leading international business standards, quality management, environmental management, occupational health and safety, and the bestseller last year, anti-bribery. All of these standards help to build more resilient and productive supply chains across the global economy. So how will all this be affected by Brexit? UK is a leading player in the international and European standard systems. BSI, in its role as the national standards body, provides that infrastructure for UK to participate. In the white paper published on the 23rd of January 2017 by government on the United Kingdom's exit from a new partnership with the European Union, there's a useful statement on the national position and BSI's responsibility to support business and industry through this process. The European standards organizations, SEN, SENELEC and ETSI, are not EU bodies, it states, though they have a special status in the EU. Approximately 25% of published European standards have, in part, and while still voluntary, been developed by the European Standards Organizations as a result of requests from the European Commission. This subset of standards provides businesses with a way of demonstrating compliance with EU product laws. The government white paper goes on to say, we are working with BSI to ensure that our future relationship with the European Standards Organizations continues to support a productive, open, and competitive business environment in the UK. We'll take questions later. SEN, SENELEC, and ETSI <coughs> are private organizations <coughs> sorry, that provide the means by which UK experts from industry, society, and indeed government can influence the content of consensus standards that will be adopted identically by 34 countries across Europe, providing a basis for that plug and play international trade. The commitment of these countries to the withdrawal of conflicting national standards adds to the value of UK participation in that system. Remember that the European standards that are adopted in the UK as national standards are not, in general, an alternative to international standards. They are addressing other areas or requirements. The ambition is that they're a complementary set of documents, not an overlapping set. So we work hard with UK experts and our European partners to minimize any overlap between the international and European work. Our expectation is that by continuing to follow the international standards model in the UK, and by BSI adhering to the requirements of European Regulation 1025 2012, then the UK can continue post-Brexit to take an active part in the governance and the standards developing committees of SEN and SENELEC as a full member of those organizations. People ask, but what will happen over time if regulatory requirements diverge between the UK and the EU? Well, the simple answer is there already is a degree of regulatory divergence across the 34 countries of the European standard system. Flood protection regulations in Germany are different to the UK. The UK has additional fire furniture safety regulations that go beyond those of European countries. 
And these are accommodated in the European standard through an annex for the UK. And Jeremy mentioned earlier the wiring regulations. You might also reflect on the wide divergence of building regulations across Europe, even across the UK. Scotland, England and Wales all have different building regulations. Scotland is the toughest, but the standards used to support industry to deliver products and services are the same. There's one set of Eurocodes for structural design, chaired by Steve Denton, a UK engineer, with multiple national annexes and so on. So deregulation, that's an interesting question. What if the UK lowered its regulations for toy safety, for example, or environmental contamination? But is this likely? Is it even practical? Many regulations affecting products on the market in the UK are already high-level, performance-based regulations, so they don't contain any limit values. Limits are defined by industry and other stakeholders in the voluntary standards. This would mean that lowering or raising the bar would be quite difficult to do. And anyway, would government allow the UK to become a dumping ground for less safe products that can't be sold anywhere else in the European system? Industry won't write lower standards for itself that conflict with international standards. Remember, industry wants one standard used everywhere. Dr. Tian Hong in China said that. So this could only mean that it would require a regulatory act by our government, a technical regulation to reduce safety or quality requirements. It seems unlikely to me. Developing countries like Kenya aspire to participate in the international system and see their industries join the global economy. China wants one standard used everywhere. It seems unlikely that the UK would abandon the international model of standards for trade, writing new technical regulations that would render UK business and industry less competitive by permitting the importation of cheaper, less safe, lower quality products and services. I suggest it wouldn't be a winning industrial strategy post-Brexit. Lord Walton might turn in his grave. One important country operates a different approach. America. The international standards model is followed in all major markets except the US, where market access is largely controlled at state level rather than federal level, and multiple standards may be referenced in regulation alongside each other. Market access, even across state boundaries, is a challenge. Last month, when I was in Washington, I asked Joe Battier, president of the US national standards body, ANSI, and director of standards for the US, to explain why the US system is different. Here he is. You have a system called multiple path model that's different. It is a unique system in that we recognize that not all the solution that the world needs, that country like America needs, can be satisfied with one or two organizations doing the work. We feel that we have 240 ANSI accredited capable standards developing organizations. We want to use their intellectual capital to find the solutions for all the varied needs that we have. And that allows us to take advantage of not only ISO and IEC, but also international standards developing organizations that reside in the US. Correct. Thank you, Chair. Great to see you. In the US, there's no formal mechanism for the withdrawal of conflicting standards. New standards are simply published alongside existing standards in what they call a multiple path model. There's no simple route to the demonstration of conformity, either for client or manufacturer. And parallel models exist alongside each other. The classic example of this problem was the long-running struggle for market supremacy between Betamax and VHS in the 1980s. So the multiple standard model creates a type of free market structure where granting reciprocal market access to other trading blocks or countries that are committed to the adoption of international standards not feasible. However, there is a mutual recognition solution that retains the passport to trade model of international standards, but provides plenty of scope for trade negotiators. We call this the mutual recognition of regulatory outcome. Regulators can agree to recognize the outcome of another country's regulation as meeting their requirements for placing of products or services on their national market. In each country, on the left or on the right, this may be done by reference to an industry standard or standards, but that's a matter for each country to manage as they see fit. Under this approach, they don't need to recognize by publishing in their own country the private sector standards used by the other side to support their market structure. 
Mutual recognition of regulatory outcome does not require mutual recognition of industry standards, which, in this example, are self-evidently different. The responsibility for meeting the regulatory requirement in each market rests unconditionally with the manufacturer or supplier, not the regulator or the standards maker. This strategy should be explored for a post-Brexit world, encouraging a sharp focus on mutual recognition of the intent of a regulatory outcome between the UK and other countries, underpinned where appropriate by an international standard or other standard if there's nothing available at ISO or IEC level. Where regulations are supported in this way by an industry standard, then the first step on both sides is to agree that both countries will use international standards as a common platform or passport to trade. This is exactly how Kenya is trading with Europe. Mutual recognition of regulatory outcome is already used in connection with conformity assessment procedures, which is the system by which manufacturers claim conformity with a given standard or regulatory requirement. It seems a nonsense, for example, that BMW cars should be crash tested in Europe and again in the US. In the end, it's just the customer who pays for all that. Regulators can agree that the other side's regulatory objectives in crash testing is acceptable. This doesn't require or even need to imply recognition of the industry standard that either side uses for testing. Finally, it's really important to note that seen from a top-down perspective, market structures are complex and the use of standards and of technical regulations, which are effectively state-owned, legally binding technical standards, varies widely across sectors. The automobile industry, for example, is a highly regulated sector. Standards used for the safety of cars are primarily developed as regulations by UNECE, not by ISO or IEC, although there are many examples of supporting voluntary standards that address components or materials in car production. Here again, it's vital that the value of industry standards is not lost in the argument over the equivalence of regulatory requirements. We need to see standards as a tool for industry in their own right, recognising that standards have a high value to regulators as well, and that it's in industry interest to support this or face higher levels of regulation instead. Let me move on to my fourth and final chapter, digitisation. I commented earlier that the new frontier for business is no longer quality, it's trust. And in the world of digital products and services, privacy and security. Just as the first generation of industry standards focused on technical specification and the second generation addressed business process, over the last decade we've seen a new generation of standards emerge that address the principles and values of organisations, both as employers and as suppliers. Trust, governance, social responsibility, resilience is the mantra of today's successful corporations. And then, as if that were not enough, to be one of the leaders of the fourth industrial revolution, we need a national strategy for new standards to support the tidal wave of the digital economy. And this time, it's obvious that standards for the digital world must have global relevance, and they must be widely adopted from the outset. The digital revolution or digitization should be an important part of any vision of how the UK can tackle the twin challenges we face of low productivity and regional disparity through Brexit and into the future. At the World Economic Forum in 2013, digitization was described as the mass adoption of connected digital devices by consumers, enterprises, and governments. Digitization has already swept through some industrial sectors, financial services, obviously, the media, and will inevitably revolutionize others, such as healthcare and construction. Consumers have already seen extraordinary benefits from online bookings to social media, free communications. But the challenge is to convert that value, that new value, into GDP growth and continued employment. And there are risks too. The McKinsey report I referred to earlier describes the hollowing out of middle-skilled employment in developed countries as more efficient production methods and automation replace production and administrative work. Digital platforms, including Amazon and Uber, Airbnb, have challenged historic business models and brought new services to billions of people. The near zero cost of servicing new digital customers enables successful companies to grow at a breathtaking pace, potentially achieving global scale in a matter of years. 
The digital economy, underpinned by engineering and technology, will be transformational because of the revolution it brings in access to markets, both in the ability to reach and connect with customers and the ability of people to offer their labor. Evidence from the McKinsey report shows that 97% of the companies in France that sell online export compared with just 15% of SMEs without an online presence. So enabling companies to exploit digitization means that they can readily reach new markets. We shouldn't be so concerned about that hollowing out of skills. We should look at the opportunity in terms of global markets. The twin goals for any national economy should be to build confidence in the value of investment in automation and production efficiencies in parallel with investment in online platforms aimed at new markets, innovative business models, and connectivity with a widely distributed labor market. Electronics and digital information are everywhere, but trust is the emerging limiting factor. Embedded in the transactions between businesses, between government and their citizens, between industry and their customers, and of course, between people themselves. One way to build trust in the digital world is through consensus standards. Not just the standards of interoperability or wiring of the internet, but standards that enable industry and their clients governments and their citizens to take full advantage of the digital models and services being offered to them. They need to understand what commitments companies are making when they say how they will use the data provided to them. They need to understand who owns the data in the product they're using, their car, for example, or how the data from their embedded medical device is relayed securely to a clinical expert. And a familiar problem to all of us, how to offer informed consent. This is the front line of standards for the digital economy. It's not about technology, it's about trust. Research that we conducted in 2016 on the need for standards in big data found that the two areas most widely supported for standardization by stakeholders were ensuring the integrity of contractual terms and conditions and how organizations communicate to the wider world on the usage of their data. In the world of information and communications technology, the ICT world, Standards alongside internationally focused standards organizations, such as W3C and Etsy, there's been a plethora of small and niche participants working on standards facilitating the interoperability of hardware and software. Many of these are consortia, self-funded groupings of companies that come together to develop a technical specification, often in an open source environment. When we look across the domain of the Internet of Things, the IoT, where physical objects are each individually connected to the internet, and we ask which players are active, the picture is overwhelming. This is just a sample mapped by DKE in Germany. The same picture is common in many areas of emerging technology and ICT. Consortia have long had an important role in standards development, but there are drawbacks too. It's often unclear whether a consortium standard contains any intellectual property, which may lead to lock-in for a user or require paying for a license to effectively use the standard and they may lack an independent governance process or the ability to demonstrate formal consensus. Equally, multiple uncoordinated activities may lead to duplication of standards work, incompatible standards or gaps. BSI has been working to bridge that gap between the consortia standards and the industry standards that facilitate market access for both buyer and supplier. Following the innovative work on BIM standards that I described earlier, and smart cities and infrastructure, we're working with the Hypercat Alliance to support new standards for the discoverability of components within the IoT. The first of these standards was the Hypercat specification called PAS212, which was published last year. The Hypercat program was an Innovate UK sponsored initiative which BSI is now investing in, aimed at building a vibrant global IoT membership community with a professionally managed subscription model developed in collaboration with its founders and members. The intention is to facilitate a global alliance of collaborating cities, organizations, and companies interested in the application of the IoT and the integration of interoperable and secure digital solutions across the domains of built environment, health, mobility, and manufacturing. We shall work closely with our colleagues in Germany at DKE and DIN to align Hypercat with the Industry 4.0 standards now in development under German leadership. Our research finds that SMEs often find it difficult to exploit the data they already have, and this is only going to get worse. It's important that UK manufacturing SMEs 
quickly improve their capacity and capability for exploiting data across their supply chains. Issues that need to be addressed for them uh, include the security of intellectual property, how decisions should be made when using data from other companies, data security, reliability and ownership, or simply how to trust data from a wide range of sources, some of which are automated. We're bringing together cities from across the world to collaborate in pilot projects using PAS212, building on the achievements already made in Manchester under the City Verve project, Melbourne, and through the City Standards Institute and its links with China. BSI's latest research report on autonomous vehicles illustrates where consensus standards will be important to accelerate developments, published last week. Working with the Transport Systems Catapult, supported by the Centre for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles, the research is focused on standards development that will address key issues within the new technology. Public acceptance, the reliability of existing infrastructure, integrated, integrating connected and autonomous vehicles with existing transport systems, assessing their performance, and the basic lack of common standards and consistent policy frameworks. These examples demonstrate precisely the sort of collaborative early stage work that is needed to support digital pioneers and entrepreneurs. But this should be the norm, not the exception. Standards should form a key theme underpinning the emerging UK industrial strategy, with experts focused on where standards can support strategic priorities such as connected and autonomous vehicles, smart cities, digital health and so on. Bringing UK thought leadership on the role of standards together with UK expertise in digital technology, together with the user community, will enable us to capture the key problem statements or use cases on which a strong consensus can be based. The outputs may be formal standards, technical specifications, or simply guidance, but our goal should be to develop as quickly as possible a coherent and consistent set of knowledge for all to use. It's what Lord Livingston once called soft power. In researching this talk, I spoke a few weeks ago to Jason Matusau, General Manager of International Standards at Microsoft Corporation. Here he is in my office explaining the importance of ISO and IEC for Microsoft. Jason, tell me about the strategic importance of international standards to Microsoft for global trade and innovation. Certainly. I think what it really comes down to is having a modern mechanism of trust, some way to have those elements that need to be standardized in a voluntary mechanism and accepted on a globalized basis, that's what ISO and IEC can do for you. Tricky to keep up with that. What he said was that the commonly held perspective of ICT interoperability standardization regarding the dynamics between the consortia and formalized standardization is rapidly becoming antiquated. The implications of open source collaboration mixed with the increased role of regulatory considerations is changing the landscape. The ISO and IEC system, he says, is poised to have significant impact on global commerce in the domain of pre- and post-regulatory technical rulemaking. The unique position of ISO and IEC as universally trusted mechanisms for working on these challenges is important for governments, industry and consumers. So in this new digital world where the only barrier to your private life becoming a viral commodity is prudence, the concept of consensus standards has come of age. The model that stakeholders themselves, everyone affected by an issue, should together agree what good practice looks like is timely and effective. Standards are written by people for people. And of course, it can be open and dynamic. We're working on this today with new models of collaborative working and dynamic standards development. We want to retain the attributes I've described of open public consultation full stakeholder engagement and consensus, but we're confident that we can evolve our model to reflect market needs. We call it agile standards development. International standards of the type that I've described that fill the catalogues of the UK national standards collection contain no intellectual property, or where they do, it's carefully managed. And they can be and are easily reviewed and updated. In the global economy, international standards provide a common shared platform governed independently of vested interest to which countries all over the world can contribute. It's very clear that one of the major opportunities arising from the Brexit vote has been a renewed interest across government industry and consumers in this undervalued tool and how we may exploit our thought leadership in this space to national advantage. 
Let me offer you one final story to bring these thoughts together. It's about Africa. In Rwanda a few weeks ago, I caught up with Yves Gazikwa, president of the African Regional Standards Organization. Africa is starting the journey towards a continental free trade area, which aims to promote intra-regional African trade. Standards play a key role within this development, with international standards the goal. Eve explained to me that at a continental level, they intend to have two tracks of standards development. The first for products that are exclusive to Africa, developed by regional technical committees. The second in response to stakeholder demand, where they'll identify and adopt a suitable international standard before embarking on an African work item. Here she is, explaining how important the role of standards is to their future development. It was super to see you. Tell me about the importance of international standards for Africa. Well, Scott, it's wonderful to see you. And uh, as usual, I'm always excited to see you. Well, international standards, we believe that it's a very, very good time to start talking about this because we truly believe that it's time for Africa to participate in the global economy. And therefore, um, international standards are critical right now for Africa. As you know, Africa is a growing continent and there's so many things that are happening. So we really look forward to ensuring that our companies, our SMEs, all of this is coming together as we are growing Africa. Thank you so much. Lovely to see you. Pleasure. To see you. Nice to see you too. I hope in this talk I've challenged some of the historic perceptions on the role of consensus standards and their supporting role to industry at international, European and national level. I hope I've demonstrated that there is keen global interest in shaping the consensus knowledge for industry that forms a passport to trade and economic growth. I hope we can continue the conversation. I and my team at BSI would be delighted to discuss how we can and should raise the awareness of the role of standards in the digital economy across the breadth of UK engineering and technology. Our role in the national standards body is to ensure that the engineering profession and industry, consumers and government can make informed decisions on the role that standards might play in their strategy. Of course, it's their decision. Industry, entrepreneurs, digital pioneers, whether and how standards could benefit their business. I'm just the messenger. Thank you very much. The whole point of consensus knowledge is it's market-led. It, it, it can't be government-led, and it's certainly not standards body-led. Uh, our role is to follow the market, so we do a lot of work in trying to understand what is the real market need. You do get people you know, popping up and saying, well, I've got a great idea for a new standard for potholes. You know. And then you say, well, actually, we may already have that. and industry doesn't want that. So we're very, very careful to test the market relevance of the work that we embark on. And, and our, our purpose is really to be a facilitator. I often say uh, to, you know, to the team, look, we don't write standards. You know, we, don't even, we certainly don't set standards. Our job is to just get people in a room and pour the coffee in and help them come to a consensus and then we'll capture it and write it down and package it, but actually it's your standards. So I think the key to this is that there will always be uh, a, a, an important role in, in assembling and capturing knowledge uh, uh, in all forms. You know, uh, and the key to this is that there's a set of attributes here that provide a common passport, a passport to trade, that might be useful in some capacity as Jason said, there's a role for that consensus standards that's been uh, achieved, including regulators, consumers, industry, suppliers. There's a role for that. And there's also a role for, for stuff that's been done privately, you know, uh, proprietary tools, standards and knowledge. There's a role for all of that. And it's for the industry and, and entrepreneurs to, to, to decide what is the best. But from our perspective, we are industry-led, industry-driven. We are under uh, and, and very delighted to be, to be able to say to industry, yes, but um, we offer a, a consumer engagement, regulator engagement. My own team, we have a consumer and public interest network in my team, so we're there bringing those people to the table that perhaps parts of industry can't bring. So we're offering a neutral and independent facilitation process, and there's an important role for that in the global economy. Well, that's a great question. So uh, we're always on the lookout for stakeholders from small uh, innovative startups, and we have a range of 
uh, uh, tools to try and do that. One is just general awareness. Secondly is working through associations, trade associations, industry associations, uh, innovator communities to say, you know, this opportunity is available to you. You can participate in this if you choose, um, perhaps through uh, the IET, perhaps through the Royal Academy of Engineering. We need to be out there with more engagement with SME and innovative communities. So I think the, you know, the uh, opportunities are, are limitless to participate, and we will do our level best to encourage people to do that. Great Thank question. You. Thank you, it is. I'm yet to be tested on this, but I, I believe my statement is correct. I'd love to change that. I'd love to change it. I think it should be an essential part of, of all of our universities, enterprise hubs. I think it should be essential modules in our business uh, schooling programs and MBAs, and we're offering that, that as a service. So we have in our own team, my own team, we've increased our engagement uh, resource precisely for that purpose. And I spend a lot of time running around trying to, trying to speak to people, Strathclyde University, Cambridge University, our excellent uh, universities, trying to say, look, this is all here for you. If you want it, you have it. But uh, I think it would be very exciting to try and project a new message around the value of standards uh, as, a, as one of the tools available to the innovation community. Well, um, good thought, actually, and, and uh, potentially. Um, but the point here is about what is it that you're trying to, to codify as good practice? Is it the size of your bank card, you know, your credit card? That's a good thing to agree on, isn't it? You know, even if you're a different manufacturer. So in, in, in the Betamax VHS uh, argument, it might have been nice if they'd agreed on the, for the consumer, if they'd agreed on basic things, you know. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity in a, in, a, in, a, in a consensus process of the type you describe, the, the companies trying to innovate and offer some new solution will not wish to uh, divulge or share all of that information. So what they'll be trying to agree is what are the basic parameters that we're trying to, to uh, agree here? What, what the model, you know, the dimensions, you know, the set-top box argument that if we could agree the shape of the set-top box, we could all move on and, uh, and innovate around that. So I think that there will, there's always a, a huge opportunity. And what we're trying to do is just to bang those pitons into the rock slope so that the companies themselves can innovate from that. So their, their investors have confidence that they're moving on a track, that their suppliers know what they're doing. There's a very good example um, quoted of plastic electronics, where you know, we, we did a lot of fantastic science in that, but, but the industry is not in the UK. And, and the argument was that had they known about this tool of consensus knowledge, they would have got to market six months earlier, 18 months earlier, whatever. It would have been an advantage to them because they were, they were struggling to, to explain to their suppliers what it was they were wanting to source. Had they used a standards tool in consensus, they might have been able to deal with that, uh, satisfy investors, and move on. So it's about codifying through the consensus route what it is that that community wants to agree but it's not a panacea, it's not gonna cover everything. <laughs>